All right. Uh, looks like for some reason you guys came back for week two. Uh, <laughs> this, this is the uh, Distracted Gamers. We actually have a website, and that's oh, the only you way you found us, but we didn't actually give you guys a, uh, a URL. If you're listening to this, you know where the website is. Why am I, get, why am I sharing this information? Uh, we are on Twitter um, as well. I think we're listed as the DG Podcast. Yeah, something not? like that. Uh, DGpodcast.com, or DGpodcast, at DGpodcast would be the Twitter account. Um, you can chat with us there or, or say hello. Now, I know you guys are viewing the website, and uh, I haven't got a lot of response, so say hello even if we suck. Give <laughs> Hello okay. even if we suck. Yeah. Uh, derogatory comments towards Vaughn are always welcome. Encourage. Um, <laughs> encourage. Well, at least that way we get a response. And I've actually had some uh, some pretty cool people at us on Twitter. Um, nice. And our uh, some of our first ones have been uh, communicating with me on there, but we haven't gotten any emails, so email if you guys want to add in. Now, now this isn't necessarily set in stone yet, but in the future, assuming that we get to the point where you guys are listening and participating or whatever, we would like to get to the point where we would have somebody from the audience, maybe even once uh, every time we release this podcast, join us to play a game with us and talk about stuff. Um, we're... We not that it's entirely gimmicky, but we would actually be interested in, in participating with the community and not just having you guys on ask you a question. We would like to play a game with you. So in the future, if you decide you want to want to do that, please please jump in now. Uh, if you listen before, uh, my name is Rhett. That's Rhett with an R, not Brett with a B. Uh, with me, we have uh, the Puntastic Vaughn. Yay! Yay! And Jason. And Jason, yeah, you make it sound so exciting to have me here. Well, I'm not. I'm <laughs> <laughs> no, we we got Jason. We actually got some interesting stuff to talk to. I'm I'm going to start out right away um, by talking about the Metal Gear Solid Five news. I don't know if you guys have heard about it. Nope. Mm-hmm. Um, apparently, David Hayter is not doing Metal Gear Solid Five. He's not playing Snake. Guess who is? Who is it? Keeper Sutherland. Keeper Sutherland, really? Keeper Sutherland, I kid you not. And and you could see video of him with the little balls on his face because they want a very dramatic acting experience. I, I don't know what the garbage is. Now, look, I know Kiefer Sutherland might be a better actor than David Hayter, but at some point you have to say, well, we... <laughs> we David Hayter's kind of been doing Snake for a, a while now. Why would we get a new voice actor? Exactly. Well, he is Snake. Yeah. Let's say. He is the character. Why are we uh, jumping ship right now? What? It Must doesn't make too sense. Expensive. I. I don't think I, Kiefer Sutherland. Kiefer, Kiefer Sutherland's uh, charge for for playing Snake is going to be more expensive. Yeah, that's kind of my feeling. They'll get more people to play here in the United States instead of just Japan. <laughs> Well, that's the thing, though. They have a Japanese actor for the end that they do in, in Japan. It, David Hayter is the American guy. Right. It, it, it doesn't make any sense anyway. Maybe they're just trying to get away from hating. What do you mean? Well, his last name's Hayter. He can't be that nice of a guy. Oh, gosh dang it, Vaughn. <laughs> <laughs> this is... Something everybody who ever listens to the podcast is going to have to understand. Vaughn lives most of his social life with his children, and his jokes reflect that. If that high. Well, the strange thing is, as young as your kids are, you can still see the embarrassment in their faces. Uh (laughs) (laughs) Uh-huh. Very it's true. like I fully predict you to be that father when they're older to utterly not want you around. It's like they turned him on, like don't have him in the room when I bring the boy friend home or something like that. <laughs> I am looking forward to being cantankerous and problematic. Well, right, but uh, you have that that father that cleans his gun when he's home, whereas I half expect Vaughn to come out in, like a mine costume. <laughs> I, I don't understand like that before, and he's not even that good at it. Oh no, I wasn't. 
You you tried it, apparently. Oh yes. Gosh dang it, Vaughn. <laughs> right, well, I promised everybody last time that I was gonna give a review of uh Oh, Graveyard boy. of the Fireflies. Graveyard of the Fireflies. I watched it today to make sure that I was totally available to talk about it. Um, if you guys aren't familiar with it, Graveyard of the Fireflies this is an older anime. I don't, I don't know what year it came out. Don't know either. No, no references. The the, the art style seems a bit older. It actually seems re- reminiscent of uh, the art style of Akira. If anybody had seen that. Yeah. I actually quite like the show. Now, to preface Graveyard of the Fireflies, if you're an anime fan, it's not really anime. It's a cartoon war movie. Or more like a depression movie. <laughs> Isn't it? Because <laughs> I'd equate it to watching something like Schindler's List, just not as graphic. Yes. <laughs> now, I love the era of World War II and being somebody that's really into history. Um, I, I did enjoy it. Um. However, much like Schindler's List, you don't watch it on the weekend with popcorn. You kind of have to be in the mood. I've seen it once, and I, I don't plan on seeing it again. Right. It, well, it's not a recreational movie. Now, the, the movie is somewhat depressing. Um, I I don't even know if I want to go, hey, spoilers, because I don't care if you haven't seen the movie. If you haven't seen it by now, then that's your problem. Um <laughs> No, I, I always hate the fact that guys have to preface stuff with, hey, spoilers, as if they're really worried about that one guy that listens to it who gets pissed off. It's like, so what? What, are you going to not listen to the podcast anymore? Woo! Uh, I, don't, I, I don't think I really have any spoilers to give. It's, it, it's basically a, a story about two kids, an older brother and a, uh, his little sister, who lived during... World War II in Japan during the uh, firebombing uh, that occurred. And if you know anything about history, the firebombing was pretty devastating. Uh, uh, interesting factoid, the person who implemented the firebombing, or at least the, the tactic for doing so, was uh, uh, Friedman, I believe his name was, uh, who was the secretary, the defense secretary, I believe, during uh, Vietnam. Hmm. Hmm. Um, Explains uh, why they firebombed Vietnam. Well, well, here's the reasoning I got from a documentary I saw on the guy. He essentially explained it as he went down, looked at the information, and decided that if they dropped bombs that ignited fires, they would be this much more efficient at causing damage in Japan as opposed to just dropping bombs. And the guy was a statistician, if anything. And he came up with the idea of dropping fire bombs because he knew that Japanese houses were built with uh, basically flimsy... Wood and rice paper. Right. Stuff that's going to burn really easily. And in the movie, they basically... The first part of it is the house is being firebombed and the mom gets it. And it's, it's really sad. And it's not even a happy ending movie. Oh, no. No, um, Schindler's List makes you feel more uh, comforted by mankind. <laughs> it, it goes into the same category as The Power of One for me, which oh, is yeah. in South Africa, a kid loses his parents, has to grow up in the orphanage. Is that, is that the apartheid movie or whatever? Yeah, it is. And basically everyone around him Dies, yeah, and he the just girl he keeps likes. getting up and moving forward. Uh, Empire of the Sun. I haven't seen it. Um, it's about a little boy living through war and trying to survive and find enough food to eat. It's a little bit more heartwarming because things work out in the end, or at least did somewhat work out in the end. Um, uh. First ever movie by uh, the guy who did Batman. Um, Nolan Ryan? No, the Batman. That, Nolan Ryan was a pitcher in the uh, Major League. Yeah, look, Nolan Ryan. <laughs> um, not Christopher Nolan, the guy who played Batman. Oh, okay, there we go. That's why I have my wife around. She knows people and names in popular areas. Um. 
I'm, I'm going to Google it because this is going to make me mad. Um, Christian Bale. Ah. His, his ever first oh, movie. Oh, you meant him. I thought you meant way back, the, the like... No, uh, I'm talking actually Bat, Christian Bale, the guy who played that. Um, the movie's really good. Um, I enjoy it. It's more of a, uh, uh, human story. The struggle, overcoming obstacles, and, and what have you. Uh, it's, it's a good movie. I, I'd have to say it's my favorite. And if you guys care to see it, let me know what you think. Graveyard of the Fireflies. To start us out in a very depressing, uh, direction. <laughs> it's a tough um, one. If I were to give it, it's done really well. If I were to give it an out of ten, um, I don't know, a nine. It was really well done. It's just not a movie you want to see a lot. Oh, <laughs> uh, it it's emotionally uh, draining. The the distracted gamers first review. I'm going to give it a nine out of ten. Nice. It's uh, one of the very first movies uh, Ben Stiller was ever in, by the way. Hmm. Yeah, he really young guy, and he's in there with... Uh, uh, boy. Okay, which I'm movie so, are we talking about John, now? Empire of the Sun. Uh, John Malkovich. Uh, and they're basically Americans. The, the fast-talking Americans of... Where Christian Bale's a British kid. Right. Uh, depression. Uh, moving on. <laughs> moving on to something more referenced. Uh, actually, let's start out today with Jason. Uh, what did you want to talk about? All right. I got to got to kind of set this up, but I wanted to talk about um, things. And and Vaughn pointed. Uh, Vaughn and I were discussing this a little bit earlier, and he pointed it out that it's kind of a um, an oxymoron, but but things that obviously have an ulterior motive. Um, now, I want to preface this with uh, a, um, a little story. I, I met this guy several years ago. Um, he's a, he, he's a Raelian. I don't know if you've ever come across anybody from that particular religion. Uh, but it's, it's, a, it's a UFO religion. Similar in some respects to uh, Scientology, but uh, it was started by a oh yeah a French yeah a French guy reporter. That... He, he used to report on race car driving and on those uh, races, and uh, he uh, was abducted by aliens, and they um, gave him their word to bring to humanity and. Um, Basically, human For cloning. Seconds, uh, he's the one guy to do it. Yeah, yeah. Human cloning is the is the ticket to immortality and. Uh, um, yeah, and so, he went to Japan in uh, late nineties. philosophical. Ar- well, sorry to, to jump. No, on no, keep people. going. There are philosophical arguments to be made, very reasonable arguments about how cloning isn't really making you immortal. It's just creating just another copy right? that has the same experiences and it's not actually you. But what, what, what were you saying, Vaughn? I re- yeah, while I was in Japan, Japan he, he showed up to do a, a conference. The guy that yeah. made the religion? Rollian. Yeah, yeah Raul. Right, Rael. His, his name is like, his real name was like Claude something or other, which kind of makes you, you know, it's kind of obvious why he went with Rael after that, but um, anyway, uh, I, I check up on it every once in a while just to just because I'm I'm curious. Like I said, I met the guy, um, and I periodically want to check to just see if the religion's still around, that kind of thing. Well, I came across this uh, this movement. That they that they backed. It was actually started by the the founder of the the religion back in like 2007, and it's the the Go Topless movement. And uh, it's the the what they say is that they uh, that they're doing this for women's right to e- equality, and 
they they uh, <laughs> they believe that it, you know the the genders are not equal because women men can go topless in public while women cannot. And the first thing that popped out at me was that not only was this a, a movement that uh, is led by a man. Um, but basically, it's all about how to see women topless for free. You know, it's not even no, a. It it just seems like a blatant thing to me. And I read one of the one of the leaders of the church. She's a woman, and uh, she she mentioned that a lot of men come to their uh, their rallies and stuff. And I'm going like, yeah, I wonder why. And, you know, the the whole thing, it's it's all about women being equal with men. And yet, at the same yes. time, this you just have I have this of women. in my head that says the reason he's doing it is so that he can see women topless. <laughs> I have, I was in a class, a Shoto class that was between Japanese and the art uh, departments of the university. And one of the art students did a, a a writing and then drew on it the figure of a woman. And I remember thinking at the time that it didn't add anything to the art project he'd done. It just seemed like art was an excuse to look at women. <laughs> well, a good way, especially when it comes to movies or whether it's writing or any medium, if you... Think about a scene that can be completely taken out and will not change the story or the movie in any way, then it's unnecessary, superfluous, and needs to be removed. Now, not to, be co not to come down excessively on people that care about uh, whether or not there's nudity in the movies they see, to each his own or whatever you want to do. But nine times out of ten... If you come down to it and think about whether or not a sex scene or a nudity scene in a movie is even necessary and would change the story if it was completely removed, you'd be hard-pressed to make that argument. I, I, I agree with you there. I mean, a lot of times it seems that they put those in and it's just, I mean, you can have a, a more tasteful scene and it won't change the, the story. But they just well, want to uh, make it so that you can see some actress nude. Well, well right. That's fine. Um, and, and if you want to express a love for these characters, some sort of passion moment, and you care to put nudity into it, whatever. If people want to see it, they'll go see it. My point being, if you completely removed that sort of thing from the movie, does it actually change the movie? I mean, and I can think of a few movies just off the top of my head where if you remove some scenes, the movie would be basically the same thing. Right. Uh, Watchmen, for example, I don't think much would change if you remove some of the sex scenes in the movie. Honestly, it, nothing, <laughs> nothing would be different. It would still be somewhat depressing of a movie. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, movie's, the movie's twisted, and I don't know if you'll ever find... Uh, What's the guy who uh, who wrote the, the comic? Uh, Moore. Alan Moore. Alan Moore. Yeah. Alan Moore. Who never cares for anything anybody does based on his material. Like, he got mad at... Uh, isn't it DC that releases his stuff? Yeah. There was, yeah, there was this big hullabaloo between him and DC because they had uh, released Watchmen toasters. <laughs> and he was furious that they had done it. I don't know if it's... Uh, destroying the brand name or his vision of what it's supposed to be. But I found it hilarious because he never cares for anything anybody does based on his work anyway. And the <laughs> fact that people have uh, uh, copyright control probably just pisses him off. Um, interesting, interesting aside. Um, oh, I, I don't know. What was the, what was the premise for your, for your little segment? It was segment? just that, that uh, people don't, hide their mo their ulterior motives as well as they should you know <laughs> it's just that i i could i could totally see some woman starting this movement and then it makes sense because 
then it's a it's a movement about women for women. But this is a man starting a movement um, that's all about uh, allowing women to be topless in public. And it just screams to me that this guy is doing this not for women's rights. And although women may be on board and whatnot, but it's all about how he can get a strip show without paying for it. Right, the religion of seeing women. Isn't that understand. what uh, the Bernie Man sh- show is out in the desert? Gosh. I'm going to make an effort to alienate, at least from my end of this triforce of a group here, <laughs> anybody who attends uh, Burning Man, because you people are stupid. <laughs> you're just, you're just stupid. And if I and if I have to basically destroy a whole segment of anybody that would listen to this podcast, and so be it. I, <laughs> to be honest, if you like it, whatever. But I, I I'm going to give you my opinion. <laughs> I, I don't. It does. It doesn't make any sense. I, I could go off on it, but we're more about other things and political commentary or social <laughs> issues. Uh, well, I suppose if if we were to point out things in popular media that that had that was along that same vein, you could find a lot of music that's pretending to be one thing when there, there's ulterior motives uh, right. pushed within it. Um, there's a uh, uh, there's a band from Finland that I actually really like that I found through a video game. Um, Max Payne, uh, and if you recall, uh, Max Payne, the, 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 the people who end up doing, uh, uh, I think they were the publishers or the people that made the game, uh, part of Rockstar, uh, a lot of them that did it were in Finland, uh, the company that made the game, Max Payne 1 and 2, I believe. At any rate, the, the guys that they used for the music for the game is a group co- called Signs of Life, who happened to be... Uh, Finnish, but they sing in English. Mm-hmm. Obviously, if you sing in Finnish, you're basically reducing it to one nation that right. can listen to your music. So it, it, in music, especially with a lot of uh, foreign countries, if you have any plans of making it bigger than what you are, you kind of have to do it in English because most, like any American, usually doesn't care to listen to, I don't know, music in Portuguese because I can't understand it, whereas the Brazilians will listen to American music. When, when I was down in Brazil, one of the biggest bands down there was Guns N' Roses. I wish. One of the biggest bands that um, when I was in Italy was... Uh, <clears throat> oh, shoot. Now I can't even remember what, what their name is. Um, it's not Boys to Men. Uh, Insane Backstreet Girls. Boys. Backstreet Backstreet. Boys. That was it. To be fair, though, I'm going to have to... I don't even know why I'm saying this. If if there were a contest between NSYNC and Backstreet Boys, I'd come down on the end of Backstreet Boys. <laughs> that, that one music video that was really cool with space battles, and the fact that that thing existed made me like them. <laughs> I don't know if you've seen it. Uh, oh, it, the music video is actually mildly cool because... In the music video, for some reason, they're like, the band is in space and waking up, and then they have a space battle against women and other starships. <laughs> <laughs> it's hilarious, and the... Oh, man. It's... <laughs> the fact that they made that, and as fun to watch as it was. Um, I know there are some video games with ulterior motives. I it, It's hard to... It's something I'd have to chew on for a bit. Um, how, how about we move on to what Vaughn wanted to talk about? I came across a, uh, a series of shows on Netflix the other day. Uh-huh. The Prophets of Science Fiction. It's a... So we're, we're going to have, what, L. Ron Hubbard and... Close. It has... Not quite that kind of prophet. All right. It has Mary Shelley, Philip K. Dick... H.G. Wells, Arthur C. Clarke, Isaac Asimov, Jules Verne, Robert Heinlein, and George Lucas in season one. Robert Heinlein was one of my favorite authors while I was growing taller. 
And listening to the hour-long documentary made me realize how much his writing influenced my viewpoints that I, I view that I should be capable and that if I can do something, I should be the one that does it. I'm questioning that now because I'm willing to let other people do things for me. But at the same well, well, that's a that's a humility factor, but yeah. So I'm derailing you with my whole comment, but go ahead. What other authors in science fiction and fantasy have formed how you view the world, and why? Go, son. Well, when I was younger, I didn't uh, read a lot of sci-fi. I still don't. I, I'm much more of a um, Tolkien fantasy kind of guy, but. Um, you know, I did watch a lot of Star Trek with my dad, and so Gene Roddenberry uh, was highly influential in, in as I was growing up and thinking about sci-fi, and then uh, as well as George Lucas. Um, right. Is there anything in, in Gene Roddenberry's stuff that changed your point of view to reference what Vaughn's talking about? I'm trying to think. I... I don't really think because about there was stuff that I like, but I don't. I can't say that it changed my view on things. Um, I find that I view things uh, a lot different than Vaughn does. Um, when I sit down and I read something, um, I don't necessarily read it f- for the the philosophy behind the author's viewpoint or whatever. Um, well, I, no, I I'm gonna I'm gonna slow down your conversation really quick. I was thinking about today to reference that video games and how they've been talking about how video games are art and this real stupid discussion about whether or not video, video games should be considered art. Look, there are two factors that make up whether or not a video game is any good. The game part, which means it has to be fun. Now, it could be artistic and inspiring or whatever you want to do, but if it's not enjoyable to, to play, or if it's a book, if it's not enjoyable to read, it, it's somewhat meaningless. And people seem to forget, because I like to bring up video games that are really artsy or uh, uh, express some sort of point of view, and, and that's why they should be considered art. And the first thing I have to say is, well, is it fun? Because if it's not fun then it's meaningless to, to the overall uh, industry in and of itself. And and if a book is good or fun to read, it makes a big difference way. as to whether or not it has an influence on you. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah. But I'm going to counter that with uh, Graveyard of the Fireflies. All right. Was that fun? Uh, Yes. Oh, okay. I didn't enjoy it while I was watching it. Well, I, I'm, it's not like roller coaster fun. I'm not sitting there going, wee! I mean, <laughs> but it's entertainment, and I would classify it as such, and it's entertaining. Uh, the only reason why the, the, the movie even, people even know about it, or it's even referenced in any way, is because the, because it's good. Yeah. I enjoy Schindler's List. I like it. Whether or not I classify it as fun, I, I don't think you could say movies in and of themselves should have the purpose of being fun. They should be enjoyable. Video games should be fun. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, it, it, if, I were, if I were to push to it, yeah, I liked the movie. I enjoyed it. I, I'm not going to say it was fun. I've read some books that were not enjoyable to read. The Magus is one of them. But at the same time, the dude, the it, counts, came. it counts as art and literature. It's been listed on top 100. Uh, well, well, you're 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 also reducing it to a very subjective direction. That's true. Which is just fine. People like different things. Um, I I could bring up a book that I have. It's on my shelf and I don't care to run and get it. If you want to know what this book is, email, comment, whatever. I think you can find us on iTunes as well, right, Jason? Well, we were trying to set it up, but I haven't been able to find us there yet. We are apparently there. We are not there. Anyway, there's this book I read 
where the story and the premise and how everything works is very interesting. It's not very well written. <laughs> um, well, am I going to read it again? No. Uh, it was an interesting book. Am I going to recommend it to other people? Eh, probably not. Um, and that's sort of uh, a crux you have to stand on. And it's a science fiction book, but that's a crux you have to stand on when you read that, that sort of thing, or you expect people to read it. Is it going to be enjoyable to read? Nobody's going to read, no matter how brilliant your point of view is, a book that's boring. Nobody. If it's not... If it's not enjoyable to read, now I'm talking fiction, nonfiction's a whole different. They may game. read it once. They may, they may read it once. Mm. Look away. Uh, I read a book. It was a sci-fi book. It's called um, "The Day the Tri- Tripods Came." I think. Um, I could be get. A, it's in a series, and I read one book out of the series, and I never went back to read the rest of them because I hated the first book that I read in that series and it was all about these tripods that came from outer space and enslaved the planet and um, the the different things that they did to keep humanity um, in check and under their thumb you know they're they're but and I'm sure people thought it was great I mean I read it for extra credit in a class I had back in elementary school. So there was a motive behind behind reading it. There was a, a reason that I read it. But uh, I would never read it again, and I don't think that I would ever read another book by that same author, just because <laughs> I was so bored trying to get well, through that stupid the, thing. The Thomas Covenant, The Unbeliever books. Oh, which is just, just crappy. You know, I enjoyed them when I was short. Well, they they were they were well written. the The environment was interesting and enjoyable. He had a very interesting, um, I don't know. He 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 had a well thought out world yes. that he established things in. The main um, character was. To, but you hate the main character, and it's an odd experience to read a book and wish the main guy dies. At some point, when it's like when dangerous situations happen, you sort of roll your eyes and go, so? And you're like, you're not really that into the guy, and you kind of wish that he'd just keel over anyway. I think I um, made it through the first chapter of the first book, and I At some point, stopped. it defends you, and you're, eh. Yeah. Well, if you're far enough through a book, I've noticed that I have to finish it, otherwise it stays open in my head. Oh, right. I have that same problem. I read a, a boatload of the uh, Sword of Truth series, partially because I read the first one because a friend of mine said that she wanted me to read it. I read the first one. She gave me the second one without me asking for it, and I read the second one. And at some point, is like when you're three books in, you're thinking, this 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 series is not very good. But you kind of you have to keep going. <laughs> you invested time. Now, I wouldn't have bought them, but she kept giving them to me, so I don't know. I think part of the problem was she was a girl. <laughs> um, I'm not sure where to go on this next mission. Crap. Well, well, well let's, let, let's at least go back to Vaughn's original point of are there books that influence you. Yeah, uh, Tolkien did when I was younger. I started out with The Hobbit, and I read a lot of books. There were some, uh, there were some, some little westerns and little adventure stories that probably has some influence on me. Uh, influence in the, in the enjoyable sort of young, young boy sense. I, I'd say there were some books. I, Tolkien's whole view of the world and how uh, individual effort can make a difference um, and that good people have to rise against what's wrong. I, I, I actually do like that sentimentality. Um, and there is an underscoring message, if you will, even if it's not uh, generally put out there. I th- There might be some other books. I'd have to, I'd have to ponder on the thing. Uh, yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to, like I said, I'm trying to think. I, I did really enjoy the, actually, 
now that I think about it, I did really enjoy the the sci-fi series um, Book of the Damned by um, Alan Dean Foster and uh, his his uh, Pip and Flinks series was was really good. Um, it did kind of make me, uh, and that was another book that kind of I felt had a bit of a, a point, and he was trying to beat me over the head with it. But I enjoyed the book. Um, humans in in that particular setting turned out to be the the, the perfect soldiers, um, and these aliens came to Earth to recruit us because. Um, of our cap- capabilities. Right. And so it, it got kind of, uh, um, I, I think it got a little heavy handed with the humans doing violence to humans and that, that kind of stuff. I'm going back to Voska, so I, I'm not sure, like I said, where the other mission is, but sorry for the interruption. <laughs> yeah. Well, by the way, the whole point of the podcast is we're actually playing a game while we're, Talking about things. Uh, gimmicky, perhaps, but we're distracted gamers. But I'm bummed. Uh, that, <laughs> that being said, I mean, there are books that I really enjoyed when I was younger. Um, influence? I, I don't know. I, I, when I was in my uh, early 20s, uh, Elantris, I really enjoyed it. Brandon Sanderson. Mm. Uh, and he's a very good modern writer, I would say. And I have I don't have a lot of respect for modern writers as far as the quality of their work. Um, I'm I'm an older older guy. Uh, the Tolkien style or the uh, I I do enjoy uh, Ouroboros. Uh, what is that? Uh, who's the author of that, Jason? Um, Edelson. That, that... I, I think so. I, I'm still. I'm still hashing it my way through it. Jason, let me borrow it. I, um, it was a part of the reason I picked that up was because uh, I I got uh, Barlow's Guide to Fantastic something or other. I forget what it was, and the the Witch King that's in that book is in it. And then I was at Borders one day before they went out of business, and I saw it there, and there was a quote on the cover from Tolkien. And so I picked up that book because um, I wanted to I, I I wanted to figure out you know you know Tolkien gave this guy a a, a kudos on it so I figured that I want to figure out what it was about thing so well to be fair though the book uh, it's hard to penetrate at first it it has it has a little bit of a learning curve I don't well, know it was if that's written good. back in the 1920s. Right, so it's not exactly, but as soon as you get into it, you, you get used to the dialogue, and it's 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 an interesting book. Yeah. Um, the, the imagery isn't even something I I like to, to gravitate towards. It's got a lot of sort of Babylonian imagery and stuff, but it's it's an Very interesting, good. and I do enjoy uh, the story at least so far. I, it's going to be one of those great Herculean efforts to finish this thing. <laughs> I agree with you. It, it was, uh, it was an enjoyable book, and I enjoyed, like I said, I enjoyed reading it, like you said, and and uh, and whatnot. But yeah, it, the the way that uh, some of the words have endings that we don't use anymore, and spellings that we don't use anymore, I had to, yeah. I had to kind of get into the mindset when I was reading it, so that I could translate as I went along. Well, serious podcast today um <laughs> serious books about literature and um <laughs> to move this towards a more uh um i don't know ridiculous direction uh i wanted uh uh not necessarily to talk about uh well let, let's phrase it this way are there any games you've played that uh were considered to be triple a titles and were bad or games that uh, were never considered to be very good that you actually enjoyed sort of something that surprised you in that sort of way I, I, I like to start out by saying well this, this isn't even a very good example but I like to point out that it's a classic thing for everybody to, to, to dump on Call of Duty 
But the, the games wouldn't sell if they weren't fun. And they're fun. And no matter how much complaining you do about Call of Duty and how much hoping you, you have that uh, games like Bioshock Infinite would outsell it, it's not going to happen. Call of Duty is actually fun to play. Uh, whether or not it inspires you is a whole different thing. But the goal of uh, the video game medium isn't necessarily to inspire you. And there have been plenty of games I've played that were fun to play, but I had no idea what was going on. <laughs> I've always like, if you were to tell me who's the main bad guy, I was like, I think he's Russian. <laughs> <laughs> I've always hated sports games, no matter how well done they were. I've always hated them. Madden. Well, I don't think I ever cared for sports games much less. What year are we on now? Madden, whatever. Seriously. I, I know. And what what do they improve now that they've got sweat graphics or something on their face? Uh-huh. It's got somewhat ridiculous. And if you're listening to this and there are sports games you're really into, plead your case, man. Like, email me or, or comment or something and tell us, hey, this is a game I like and these are the reasons why I like it. Maybe if you're eloquent enough, we'll have you on and we'll goof around with you. But... It's 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 just a thing to reference. Uh, if I were going to point out a game that, that is probably universally considered to, to, to suck, <laughs> I mean, there are some obscure games I have on my shelf that would be hard to point at. Um, I'm way over there. I liked Armored Core. Thing is, Armored Core has a very narrow appeal. Uh, it's it's got the cult following, so to speak. People mm-hmm. who like Armored Core really like it. People who don't really don't. And there's a penetration that takes place where you have to play it for a while to get into it. Uh, Winback. I don't know if you've ever played it. PlayStation Two, old game. It came around the time when we had things like uh, oh Metal Gear Solid. It's not a good Metal Gear Solid clone, but when you're young and you don't have very much money, and this is the one game you bought for that six months, you play it a lot, <laughs> and it it had its uh, it had its benefits. It had, uh, to be honest, when you got around the clunky movement and stuff, playing multiplayer with uh, my brother and cousins and stuff, it wasn't that bad. It was kind of fun to play. Uh, well, what do you what do you think, Bon? I'm trying to remember a Square Enix game that I thoroughly enjoyed. That is quiet. I didn't ever hear anybody else playing it, and I can't for the life of me think of the name of it. So I'm gonna have. Well, to... I'm gonna bring up Superman Returns for the Xbox 360. <laughs> the game is not very good, but I maxed out the achievements in that game. Well, Partially... one of the achievements you can only get if you put in one of the cheat codes. <laughs> Actually, you're you're right, and you don't get any achievement points for it. It just basically calls you a cheater, and you get zero. <laughs> um, but that that actually is one of the achievements. I'm going to point it out for two reasons. I, I I really love Superman. I like the character, and I enjoy it. And it's the first game I've ever run into where you actually feel like Superman flying around the city. Um, the combat kind of sucked the the interface, but there was there was something enjoyable about hitting uh, uh, hitting the sound barrier while flying over a uh, a free sandbox metropolis. And I maxed. Uh, and there was one of them where you had to fly like so many miles in the game to actually get the achievement. And I remember I had to tape and rubber band my controller in a way so that I flew in a circle, and I left it there overnight. <laughs> So then I got the achievement because it was so it, it just took too much effort to get this stupid thing. Um, Superman Returns game sucks, but it's that, uh, the game's actually fun to play. I mean, most of the uh, Spider-Man games, Spider-Man Two is normally considered universally to be the peak of Spider-Man video games, and the combat wasn't very good. No, but it was the freedom of movement. Well, the, the first time anybody ever made a Spider-Man game where flying around with the webs and and shooting them and swinging and it it was actually enjoyable. Yes. <laughs> um, I, I like Spider-Man and and the problem is being a fanboy if they make a Spider-Man game I'll probably get it and play it and enjoy it somewhat even if I'd have to walk away afterwards and go eh, it kind of sucked in some places. 
I found the name of it. Vagrant Story. Oh, well, well. To, now that I'm going to interrupt, but to preface this, hardcore gamers love Vagrant Story because they like to imagine themselves as having been good at it. It's, <laughs> it's through the age of video games when they were hard, and beating Vagrant Story was considered an, an achievement. The game, the game is somewhat hard, and really hardcore Final Fantasy Tactics and Final Fantasy fans liked the game. I had it. I played it. I never beat it. I played through most of it, and I got pretty darn far. But the game is, it's its like running a marathon. Yeah. It's, <laughs> well, and it was one of the first games that I had that had achievements. After you beat it, it tells you how many of these things you killed, and you can level up your achievements, and I like those. Yeah. So. Well, finding rare items, I mean, the game was fun, the puzzles were interesting, the graphics are really dated by today. Oh, they're it's horrible. Go, it's, it's blobs next to blobs. It's on back ESN. Then, it's, well, yeah, uh, back then it was a beautiful game. And w- yeah, we're talking just first PlayStation, first generation uh, PlayStation. I don't know, Jason, what do you think? Are there games that, uh, that, that suck that uh, you actually secretly like? Um, I'm trying to think, uh, uh, I like, game. uh, I like the Lego games. I know they're not, you know, they they're are not, popular. they're not considered great, but they are right. popular. They're all little. I, I, uh, I love the, the Lego games. I, I like the little in jokes that they have. I, I used to. My my friends and I, when we were younger, we would go over to my friend's house, and that's what we would do. We'd get out um, his Legos and the well, their Legos. It was him and his older brother, and we would play Legos for hours at a time. I actually, when I was uh, the, I think it was the first time I was ever exposed to Legos. I actually won a contest um, for building something. For building something out of Legos, and I got a gift certificate, and my mom used it to get me my own first Lego set. Huh. And so Legos, you know, the the whole Lego game thing has a kind of a nostalgic feel to, for me, and and so I well, really you, enjoy the Lego games, even though they're not that t- technically that great. Um, Here's the, here's the series I'm going to come down on, Gears of War. Look, the multiplayer's fun, the gameplay's fun, but uh, for somebody who plays most of their games single player, uh, it the, the game's like five hours long, and when you get to the end and you beat the guy, you stop there for a second and go, wait, that's it? I spent <laughs> 60 bucks on this thing? And I'm not going to subscribe to <laughs> to uh, Xbox Live just to shoot at other people who've been playing this for, for a year or two and try and compete with them. I mean, that's nonsense. Uh, Gears of War, I didn't care for it, I, despite the fact that gameplay is fun. And me, uh, uh, we've had LAN parties before with the, the three of us. With the Gears uh, of War, yeah. Uh, yeah, where we've gotten together and played a bunch of Gears of War in the multiplayer. And it's fun to play with your friends and banter, but I just don't care for it. it I'm not a Gears of War fan, and I have the first two. I never beat the second one because I got bored. <laughs> um. Okay, this this might uh, garner us some haters, but uh, oh, who cares? Yeah, if they're listening um, to us, then they're they're gluttons for uh, pain. <laughs> <laughs> what Halo, are you doing? Halo two and three. I I would actually agree. I love the first Halo. First Halo was awesome. It's fun if you play with other people, it, or even that you know. I could care less whether or not I'm fragging some kid I've never met who curses worse than the pirates or guys who work at ports in New York. It's, it's ridiculous. But I, I sat, sat there and I, the and I worked through, bad. I worked through game. one and was really impressed by Halo. It blew me away. And, and then I, um, then I got two and I was like, that's it. That's all it's done now. And then three came along and, and I felt the same kind of thing for the ending. It was like, they're building up, building up, and there's nothing there. And for a shooter that seems to, to 
gear itself towards being a very story driven shooter, the story falls on its face. Yeah. It's not yeah. very good. I if you disagree then fine. Send me a hate mail, but the uh, uh, gameplay wise, they're somewhat fun. But if you care about anything that's going on, then you start to fall apart. Now there was a recent uh, uh, Halo game that came out that I actually enjoyed. I think I rented it. It's not recent. It's based off a, a small group of people rather than just Master Chief. I forget it was the Halo name. Reach, right? Halo Reach. Uh, the game actually was fun. Uh, I enjoyed it much more than I ever did 2 or 3, and I hear Halo 4 is actually pretty fun. They lost me somewhere along the, the line, and I never got to, to Halo 4 or even played it. Yeah, um, I haven't played Halo 4 yet. It, I may do that I, in the future, but I was kind of su- disappointed by 2 and 3 so much that when I Halo 4 came out, it was like, eh, I'm, I'm fight not. the bark bin being, being willing to... Uh, and I loved the first Halo so much, I pre-ordered the second one, I stood in line, I have the soundtrack, um, and it was disappointing. <laughs> and it's, it's hard to assess a movie or a game immediately after having experienced it, because you're sort of still caught up in pl- having played it. And there's there are some movies that I enjoy, but the, the more time and more distance you have from it, the more you think, yeah, it wasn't that good. <laughs> um, you know what I'm yeah yeah and actually now that I've had a chance to kind of think more about it one of the games that I really enjoyed playing um, that uh, to me was actually maybe even more fun the second time through was Sudeki I don't know if I, you ever played that one oh for, right for a, no frame reference at all it's uh, for uh, the original Xbox um, it kind of had a, uh, the story was, was that the world was split in two, um, between the creator and his, and his, uh, shadow half brother kind of thing. Um, and so you got this kind of invasion coming from the other side to, from the, the, the shadow half trying to take over the light half and, um, your character's get caught up in, in trying to defeat the, the shadow part of the distracted gamers. Jason's trying to play something. (laughs) Yeah. I'm trying to not die here. And at the same time, explain kind of the story behind Sudeki. Okay. Where are you guys? Where, what are you trying to kill now? Um, I'm sorry. Um, I, I like I said, there, there's a lot of um, level grinding. I felt, but the story was pretty good for the time. The graphics were pretty good, and and I I felt that it was a it was a pretty fun game. And uh, I hadn't played it for a while. Got it back out, and actually enjoyed it more the second time that I played through it. Huh. There's some games that have that effect. I uh, Night Shield Republic. Uh, multiple playthroughs were still enjoyable, and games that are, are uh, bring you back have a uh, uh, longevity. Like I never cared to return to the story mode in Gears of War. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I, I got it. Stuff comes out from under the ground. Everybody's scared, and for some reason, everybody's built in an unnatural way. Um, I get it. I get it. Strange. Sci-fi world. Um, I had a, a game that I thoroughly enjoyed that is very rare. French game event called Purple Saturn Day. I no idea. No, it, I've never seen it available anywhere else. Found the old discs a while ago, installed it, and it has puzzles as part of it. Unfortunately, the puzzles are time-based and they're tied to the clock speed of the computer. <laughs> Since it was meant to run on an 8088, <laughs> so the five-minute thing, a five-minute challenge finished in 
three seconds. <laughs> text text adventures back in the day were fun. I don't care. Oh, I, what, I loved Zork. I never played Zork, but I've played sort of modern variations of, of text adventures, and they're they're enjoyable. Um, ah, uh, back in the day. References. <laughs> the uh, uh, video game. I'm not too excited about. We talked about this last time. I'm not super excited about the current generation stuff coming out. Um, I was right. You have to log in once every 24 hours. Otherwise, it just won't work anymore. Um, so they're basically re- reserving it to anybody with a broadband connection because you can't play. Otherwise, apparently, you're not you're not a useful person. What if you live in the middle of Iceland and like to play Halo? There's no way you can do that now. They did. Um, I did notice that they that they did come out with. Uh, Stand on your roof with a satellite dish, hoping you get a connection. Oh, a, a kind of a you know we were complaining about the the licensing and stuff. How if you had a, um, you bought the game, you have to buy a license for like everyone who wanted to play it. And their dog. Right. Well, they, they, uh, it, I, did, I did see a correction for that. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, there is a correction so that people who were... Uh, you could actually play your game on somebody else's computer, but as long as you were logged in as yourself kind of thing. Well, that, that, that's that's not necessarily the thing. So it binds to the Xbox. Right. And apparently, there's, there's an article, I think, on IGN that, that goes into more detail. But if you bring your game to a friend's house, you can theoretically play it at their house for one hour without having to log in. <laughs> um, now, now here's the thing when it comes to giving friends games and stuff. And they basically Microsoft tried to make it sound like they were hands off and it wasn't that big a deal. And it comes up to individual publishers as to what they want to do, uh, whether or not they want to charge or that sort of thing or, or whatever. But they basically said they have it set up so that if you uh, give the game to your friend as a gift, they won't have to pay for it but they'd have to re-register it to their Xbox. And yet, you could only do that once. So it's like, yeah, we're giving you a bone. You can give the game to friends if you want to, but it's now permanently theirs. And you can only do it once. And my whole conclusion was, look, if I paid $60 for this game, I own it. It's, it's my game now. There's uh, no matter what monitoring you want to do. Now, if you want to say, well, we provide updates and uh, and all these other things, so we still uh, own the property. Look, if I'm not copying the game or putting it online, then the software itself is mine. If I want to play it or I want to play it at somebody else's house, it's a localized thing. The problem is with the Internet nowadays, nowadays, what am I, 80? Uh, nowadays, when you share things, it's a lot easier to just get stuff for free. And it's like they're trying to heavy-handed control uh, the medium, which just angers me. And I have no interest whatsoever in an Xbox One. I suppose if I got it for free or for some reason had an excess of money, I might I might get one. Yeah, I'm um, not so big on it either. Uh, although I do like your... Uh, I don't foresee a future buying one. I, I do like your... Uh, if I pay eighty dollars for the game or sixty dollars for the game, then it, then it belongs to me. I like that. That's how it should be. That's not what the law says, but that's how it should be. No, nope. well, it's just a license. It yep. Well, right, but that's how it was. I have it. I can do with it what I will. If I let my friend borrow it, I no longer have it. He's got it. If I want it back, he has to give it back to me, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And there, it, it's just. It's annoying and stupid how they're going about it. Yeah, it's it's very, very much heavy-handed. And it's one of those things that I hope somebody comes up with a crack for that, that Microsoft well, all, has to say, oh, well, we didn't really think this through very well. Maybe we'll try not to do this. A crack for the 360 works. It's just if you use a crack 360 to ban your account. Yeah, well, this isn't coming from first-hand experience, by the way. I know people who have actually done it, though. Um, and they just banned the 360. So if you want to play online with people or get updates, you go online. You go buy another 360 that you use for that. But they'll always, 
that you can't prevent all hacking. So you either need to make your product more useful to purchase Shoot, than to hack, down. or um, I don't know, come down on it like you're uh, you're paranoid. Um, I am uh, I am not being a good healer. Uh, live, live. Yes, that's right. I'd be healing. It's it's a stupid thing. We're gonna we're coming down to the end of the podcast, which is much more subdued. I wouldn't call it professional. Call it that at your own risk. Um, you know I uh it, here's something stupid before I I before we we come to the end of the podcast. So I was gonna I originally planned on prefacing the show. By giving uh, our reviews from notable news organizations. <laughs> now, now it sounds stupid. Like I could get on here and say, "Well, CNN calls us uh, 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 basically the internet version of Lindsay Lohan." Or, <laughs> it, it's really stupid. But what makes it even funnier is I actually did try and call the New York Times. <laughs> Um, I, I was on I was on wait the whole time. My hope was to get a hold of a secretary and ask them what their opinion of the show. And I was hoping their response would be something like, I've never heard of them. So I could officially say, the New York Times says of our podcast, they have never heard of them. <laughs> um, I, I, was, I, was, I was on wait too long and I gave up. But uh, New York Times, the Distracted Gamers podcast, they belong in the same sentence. Awesome. Uh, Vaughn enjoys it. I thoroughly uh, do. Hey, man, it's what you got to do. Uh, obviously, we're on our website. Uh, give us comments. I know you guys are out there and you're looking at the site. Maybe you're rolling your eyes after the first podcast submission. <laughs> <laughs> but we're here. And if you want to weigh in on the stuff we talked about today, then so be it. Uh, give us a comment, and if you're into the same sort of stuff and you want to hang out with us and play a game, we'll figure something out. Um, uh, to end the podcast, we have a dumb argument about something. Now, what I came up with is a little bit too obscure, so I'm going to have to uh, uh, ease us into it. I don't even know if I want to do it that way. So, how about we do it this way? Indiana Jones with a pool noodle. Moon Knight <laughs> uh, with potato. One potato, not a sack of potatoes. Uh, I think I might have to give it to Moon Knight with the potato. You think? Well, how is he going to kill Indiana Jones with a potato is my question. There's got to be some choking hazard involved in the... Well, if he hits him, hits him in the throat hard enough with it, he'll stop his breathing and go down. He's a decent shot. He has those little moon-shaped shuriken things. Moon Knight being a Marvel character, by the way. The Indiana Jones, sure, he can fight, but he's he's pretty much self-taught. Moon well, Knight he's got a scrappy a, thing, though. He can he makes it through things and he, that he and he does. Do. You're right. Well, it's, it's like if you're referencing this in an RPG realm, he would have a high luck. And that's something to that would be difficult to overcome. Because it's often the environment that defeats the people for him. No, that's well, part right. of his luck. I, I'm just saying he makes it through in in interesting ways. Um, I'm going to stand for uh, Indy, only because I don't know Moon Shadow <laughs> or Moon Knight. Moon Knight. He he's kind of like a Batman of the. Marvel Universe? Kind of, but with multiple um, with split personalities. Personality. Yeah. Isn't one of his personalities a little girl? Yep. I have a Moon Knight graphic novel on my shelf. Um, it, he's an interesting character and really jaded and brooding. <laughs> um, oh, boy, tiebreaker. Uh, uh, uh. I fall on the side I, of I, Moon Knight just because... I think Moon Knight has more training in the fighting arts. I think that would give him an edge, but Indiana Jones does possess great luck. 
Right, okay, so so I just waffled back and forth in that whole sentence you gave. Um, I initially thought Moon Knight. Uh, Moon Knight's accurate at chucking his little half moon shapes like Batman is. He's got a potato. Maybe he'll just chuck it at somebody and uh, be able to knock him out and finish it. Um, and then he went back to Indiana Jones because if you think about Moon Knight's character, uh, he's He's the superhero that gets beat up a lot and keeps going. That's true. Um, so I'm going to have to go for Indiana Jones, which means uh, I'm right and anybody else is uh, wrong. <laughs> uh, if, you, if you care about the weighing in on that discussion, which is utterly moronic, there's no way this would actually occur, but it's an interesting thing to actually think about. Uh, uh, weigh in. Uh, thanks for listening to the nonsense uh this is the distracted gamers uh the triforce of the internet <laughs> we, we play a video game and we talk about stuff and sometimes we get a little bit serious a little bit serious tonight if you uh you're all nazis the, you're all not oh well hate, there goes godwin <laughs> right all you have, just just hey, remember we made it to the second one before invoking that I know. <laughs> we got to start out with the Nazi reference. All right. Um, remember, I am not really your friend. Stop emailing me. Thanks for listening. <laughs> Bye.